The Black Dog and Other Stories by A. E. Coppard The Ballet Girl On the last night of Hillary term, Simpkins left his father's shop a quarter before the closing hour in order to deliver personally a letter to John Evans Antrobus, Esquire of St. Xavier's College. Simpkins was a clerk to his father, and the letter he carried was inscribed on its envelope as important, and a further direction, wait answer, was doubly underlined. Acting as he was told to act by his father, than whom he was incapable of recognizing any bigger authority either in this world or if such a slight, shrinking fellow could ever project his comprehension so far in the next, he passed the porter's lodge under the archway of St. Saviour's, and crossing the first quadrangle, entered a small hall that bore the names of J. Evans Antrobus and half a dozen others, neatly painted on the wall. He climbed two flights of wooden stairs, and knocking over a door whose lintel was marked Fi, Evans Antrobus, was invited to come in, he entered a study and confronted three hilarious young men, all clothed immaculately in evening dress, a costume he himself privily admired, much as a derelict might envy the harp of an angel. The noisiest young gentleman, the tall one with the monocle, was his quarry. He handed the letter to him. Mr. Evans Antrobus then read the letter, which invited him to pay in Stanter a four-year-old debt of some nine or ten pounds which he had inexplicably but consistently overlooked. And there was a half-hidden but unpleasant alternative suggested should Mr. Evans Antrobus fail to comply with this not unreasonable request. Mr. Evans Antrobus said, Damn! In point of fact, he enlarged the scope of his vocabulary far beyond the limits of that modest expletive, while his two friends, being invited to read the missive, also exclaimed in terms that were not at all subsidiary. "'My compliments to Mrs. Bagshot and Buffalo,' exclaimed the tall young man with the monocle angrily. "'I shall certainly call round and see them in the morning. Good evening.' Little Simpkins explained that Bagshot and Buffalo were not in need of compliments, their business being to sell boots and to receive payment for them. Two of the jolly young gentlemen proposed to throw him down the stairs, and were only persuaded not to by the third jolly young gentleman, who much preferred to throw him out of the window." whereupon Simpkins politely hinted that he would be compelled to interview the college dean and await developments in his chambers. Simpkins made it quite clear that, whatever happened, he was going to wait somewhere until he got the money. The three jolly young gentlemen then told little Simpkins exactly what they thought of him, exactly, admitting no shade of denunciation, fine or emphatic. They told him where he ought to be at that very moment, where he would quickly be unless he took himself off. In short, they told him a lot of prophetic things, which, as is the way of prophecy, invited a climax of catastrophic horror. "'What is your name? Who the devil are you?' "'My name is Simpkins.' Then the three jolly young gentlemen took counsel in together in whispers, and at last Mr. Evans Antrobus said, "'Well, if you insist upon waiting, Mr. Simpkins, I must get the money for you. I can borrow it, I suppose. Boys from Faz, can I?' Again they consulted in whispers after which two of the young gents said they ought to be going, and so they went. "'Wait here for me,' said Mr. Evans Antrobus. "'I shall not be five minutes.' But Mr. Simpkins was so firmly opposed to this course that the other relented. "'Damn you! Come along with me, then. I must go and see Faz.' So off they went, to some rooms higher up the same flight of stairs, beyond a door that was marked F.A. Zealander. When they entered, Faz sat moping in front of the fire, he was wrapped as deeply as an Eskimo in some plaid traveling rug skirt with pink rope of a dressing gown that lay across his knees. The fire was good, but the hearth was full of ashes. The end of the fender was ornamented with the strange little iron face of a man whose eyes were shut but whose knobby cheeks fondly glowed. As his eyes were not shut, they were covered by dim glasses, and his cheeks had no more glow than a sponge. "'Hello, Faz. You better today?' No, dearie, I'm not conscious of any improvement. This influenza is a thug. I'm being deprived of my vitality as completely as a fried rasher. Oh, by the by, said his friend, you don't know each other. Mr. Simpkins, Mr. Zoolander. The former bowed awkwardly and unexpectedly shook Mr. Zoolander's hot, limp hand. At that moment, a man hurried in, exclaiming, Mr. Evans Antropus, sir, the dean wants to see you in his rooms at once, sir. That is just awkward, said the gentleman blandly. Excuse me for a moment or two, Faz. 
He hurried out, leaving Simpkins confronting Mr. Zelander in some confusion. Faz poked his flaming coal. This fire, did you ever see such a morbid conflagration? Rather nice, I thought, replied Simpkins affably. Quite cool tonight, outside, rather. The host peered at him through those dim glasses. There's a foggy humidity about everything, like the inside of a cream tart. But sit down, said Faz, with the geniality of a man who was about to be hung, and was rather glad that he was no longer to be exposed to the fraudulent excess of life, and tell me a body story. Simpkins sank into an armchair and was silent. Perhaps you don't care for body stories, continued Faz. I do, I do, I love vulgarity. There's such a niche in life for vulgarity. If ever I possess a house of my own, I will arrange, I will, upon my soul, one augustly vulgar room, divinely vulgar, upholstered in sallow pigskin. Do tell me something. You haven't got a spanner on you, I suppose. There's something the matter with my bed. Once it was full of goose feathers, but now I sleep, as it were, on the bulge of a barrel. I must do something to it with a spanner. I hate spanners. Such dreadful democratic tools. They terrify me. They gape at you as if they want to bite you. They gape at you as if they wanted to bite you. Spanners are made of iron, and this is a funny world, for it is full of things like spanners. Simpkins timidly rose up through the waves of this discourse and asked if he could do anything. He was mystified, amused, and impressed by this person. He didn't often meet people like that. He didn't often meet anybody. He rather liked him. On each side of the invalid, there were tables and bottles of medicine. I'm just going to take my temperature, said Faz. Do you have a cigarette, dearie? Or a cigar? Can you see the matches? Yes, now do you mind surrounding me with my medicines? They give such a hopeful air to the occasion. There's a file of sodium solicitate tabloids. I must take six of them in a minute or two. Then there are the quinine capsules, the formalin. Yes, those lozenges I suck. Have one? They're so comforting, and that depressing laxative surround me with them. Oh, glorious benignant, isn't it? Now I shall take my temperature. I shall be as stolid as the Sphinx for three minutes. So do tell me that story. Where is my thermometer? Oh, he popped the thermometer into his mouth, but pulled it out again. Did you know, LG? He's a blithe little fellow. Oh, very blithe. He was in Jacobson's rooms the other day. Jacobson's a bit of an art connoisseur, you know, and draws and paints and Jacobson drew attention to the portrait of a lady that was hanging on the wall. Oh dear, said Algie, what a hag. Where do you get that thing? Just like that. Such a perfect fool, Algie. It's my mother, says Jacobson. Oh, of course, explained Algie. I didn't mean that. Of course, my dear fellow. I referred to the horrible treatment, entirely to the horrible treatment. It is a wretched daub. I did it myself, said Jacobson. You don't know Algie? Oh, he is very blithe. What were you going to tell me? I'm just going to take my temperature. Yesterday it was ninety odd point something. I do hope it is different now. I can't bear those points. They seem so equivocal. Faz sat with the tube of thermometer projecting from his mouth. At the end of the test, he regarded it very earnestly before returning it disconsolately to the table. Then he addressed his visitor with considerable gloom. Pardon me, I did not catch your name. Simpkins. Simpkins, repeated Faz, with a dubious drawl. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't like Simpkins. It sounds so minuscular. What are you taking? I won't take anything, sir. Thank you, replied Simpkins. I mean, what schools are you taking? Oh, no school at all. Faz was mystified. What college are you? I'm not at a college, confessed the other. I came to see Mr. Evans Antrobus with a note. I'm waiting for an answer. Where do you come from? From Bagshot and Buffles. After a silence, he added, Bespoke boots? Hump, you are very young to make bespoke boots, aren't you, Simpkins? Surely. Are you an agnostic? Have a cigar. You must. You've been very good, and I'm so interested in your career. But tell me now what it exactly is that you are sitting in my room for. Simpkins told him all he could. It's interesting, most fascinating, declared Faz, but it is a little beyond me all the same. I am afraid, Simpkins, that you have been deposited with me as if I were a bank and you were something not negotiable, as you really are, I fear. But you mustn't tell the dean about Evans Angelus. No, you mustn't. It's never done. Tell me, why do you make bespoke boots? It's an unusual taste to display. 
Wouldn't you rather come to college, for instance, and study um, anthropology? Nothing at all about boots and anthropology. No, said Simpkins. He shuffled in his chair and felt uneasy. I'd be out of my depth. Faz glared at him, and Simpkins repeated, Out of my depth, that, that would be sure. This is very shameful, commented the other, but it's interesting, most fascinating. You brazenly maintain that you would rather study boots than, than books and brains. The cobbler must stick to his last, replied Simpkins, recalling a phrase of his father's. Bravo, cried Faz, but not an everlasting last. And I don't know anything about all this. There's nothing about it I'd want to know. It wouldn't be any good to me. It's no use mixing things. And there's a lot to be learnt about boots. You'd be surprised. You gotta keep yourself to yourself, and not get out of your depth. Take a steady line and stick to it, and not get out of your depth. But, dearie, you don't sleep with a life belt girt about your loins, do you? I'm not out of my depth. I shouldn't be, even if I started to make boots. Oh, wouldn't you? shouted Simpkins. I should find it rather a shallow occupation. Mere business is the very devil of a business. Business should be a funny sort of life. Life's a funny business. You looked after your business, and it will look after you. But what in the world are we in the world at all for, Simpkins? Isn't it surely to do just the things we most intensely want to do? And you do boots and boots and boots. Don't you ever get out and about? Theaters, girls, sport, or do you insist on boot, the whole boot, and nothing but the boot? No, none of them, replied Simpkins. Don't care for theaters. I've never been. Don't care for girls. I like a quiet life. I keep myself to myself. It's safer. Don't get out of your depth, then. I do go and have a look at the football match sometimes, but it's only because you make the boots for some of your crack players, and you want to know what you're making them for. Work doesn't trouble me. Nothing troubles me, and I got money in the bank. Damn, Simpkins. You have a terrible conviction about you. If I listen to you much longer, I shall buy myself apprentice to you. I feel sure that you make nice, soft, watertight, everlasting boots, and then we should rise in the profession together. Discourse, Simpkins, you enchant mine ears, both of them. What I say is, concluded Simpkins, you can't understand everything. I shouldn't want to. I am all right, as it is. Of course you are. You're simply too true. This is a place flowing with afternoon tea, tutorism, claptrap. It's a city in which everything is set upon a bill. You're simply too true. If we are not out of our depth, we are in up to our ears. I am. It's most fascinating. Soon afterwards, Simpkins left him. Descending the stairs to the rooms of Evans Antrobus, he switched on the light. It was very quiet and snug in those rooms, with the soft, elegant couch, the reading lamp with the delicious violet shade, the decanter with whiskey, the box of chocolate biscuits, and the gramophone. He sat down by the fire, waiting and waiting. Simpkins waited so long that he got used to the room. He even stole a sip of whiskey and some of the chocolate biscuits. Then, to show his independence, his contempt of Mr. Antrobus and his trickery, he took still more of the whiskey, a drink he had never tasted before. He really took quite a lot. He heaped coal upon the fire and stalked about the room with his hands in his pockets or examined the books, most of which are about something called jurisprudence and such like. Simpkins liked books. He began reading. That the Pleuronectidae are admirably adapted by their flattened and asymmetrical structure for their habits of life is manifest from several species, such as soles and flounders, etc., being extremely common. He did not care much for science. He opened another. It is difficult indeed to imagine that anything can oscillate so rapidly as to strike the retina of the eye 831 trillion 479 billion in one second as must be the case with violet light according to this hypothesis. Simpkins looked at the light and blinked his eyes. That had a violent shade. He really did not care for science, and he had an inclination to put the book down as his head seemed to be swaying, but he continued to turn the pages. Snowdon is the highest mountain in England or Wales. Snowdon is not so high as Ben Nevis. Therefore, the highest mountain in England or Wales is not so high as Ben Nevis. Oh, my head, mumbled Simpkins. Water must be either warm or not warm, but it does not follow that it must be warm or cold. Simpkins felt giddy. He dropped the book and tottered to the couch. 
Immediately the room spun round and something in his head began to hum, to roar like the aeroplane a long way up in the sky. He felt that he ought to get out of the room, quickly, and get some water. Either not or cold warm. He didn't mind which. He clapped on his hat, and, slipping into his overcoat, he reached a door. It opened into a bedroom. Very bare, indeed, compared with this other room, but Simpkins rolled in. The door slammed behind him, and in the darkness he fell upon a bed, with queer sensations that seemed to be dividing and subtracting in him. When he awoke later, oh, it seemed much later, he felt quite well again. He had forgotten where he was. It was a strange place he was in, utterly dark, but there was a great noise sounding quite close to him. A gramophone, people shouting with choruses and dancing about in the adjoining room. He could hear a lady's voice, too. Then he remembered that he ought not to be in that room at all. It was, well, yes, it was criminal. He might be taken for a burglar or something. He slid from the bed, groped in the darkness until he found his hat, unbuttoned his coat, for he was fearfully hot, and stood in the bedroom door, trembling in the darkness, waiting and listening to that tremendous row. He had been a fool to come in there. How was he to get out? How the deuce was he to get out? The gramophone stopped. He could hear the voices more plainly. He grew silently panic-stricken. It was awful. They'd be coming in to him, perhaps, and find him sneaking there like a thief. He must get out. He must. He must get out. Yes. But how? The singing began again. The men kept calling out, Lulu! Lulu! And a lady's gay voice would reply to a Charlie or a George, and so on, when all at once there came a peremptory knock at the outer door. The noise within stopped immediately. Deep silence. Simpkins could hear whispering. The people in there were startled. He could almost feel them staring at each other with uneasiness. The lady laughed out, startlingly shrill. Shh, shh, the others cried. The door knocking began again, emphatic, terrible. Simpkins' already quaking heart began to beat, ecstatically. Why, oh why, didn't they open that door? Open it, open it! There was shuffling in the room, and when the knocking was repeated for the third time, the outer door was apparently unlocked. Faz, oh Faz, you brute, cried the relieved voices in the room. You fool, Faz, come in, damn you, and shut the door. Good gracious, explained the apparently deliberating Faz. What is that? Hello, Rob Roy, cried the lady. It's me. Charmed to meet you, madam. How interesting, most fascinating. Yes, I am quite charmed, but I wish somebody would kindly give me the loose end of it all. I'm suffering, as you see, dearies, and I don't understand all this. I'm quite out of my depth. The noise you've been making is just crushing me. Several voices began to explain at once. We captured her, Faz, yes. Rape of the Sabines, what, from the vaudeville? Had a rag, glorious, corralled all the attendants and scene shifters, rushed the stage we did. We did, everybody chased somebody, and we chased Lulu. We did, we did. Oh, shut up, everybody, cried out Faz. Yes, listen, cried the voice of Evans Antipas. This is how it happened. They chased the eight sisters Victoria off the stage, and we spied dear little Lulu. She was one of those eight Victorias, bolting down a passage to the stage entrance. She fled into the street just as she was. Isn't she a duck? There was a taxi standing there, and Lulu, wise woman, jumped in. And we jumped in too. We did, we did. Wherefore, says taxi man, Savior's College, say we, and here you are, Lulu. What do you think of her? Charming, utterly charming, replied Faz. The details are most clarifying. But how did you manage to usher her into the college? My overcoat on, explained one voice. And my hat, cried another. And we dazzled the porter, said a third. There were lots of other jolly things to explain. Lulu had not resisted at all. She had enjoyed it. It was a lark. Oh, beautiful, most fascinating, agreed Faz. But how you propose to get her out of the college? I have no more notion than Satan has of sanctity. It's rather late, isn't it? Simpkins, in his dark room, could hear someone rushing up the stairs with flying leaps that seized at the outer door. Then a breathless voice hissed out, You fellows, scat, scat! Police are in the lodge, with the proctors and that taxi man! In a moment, Evans Antipas began to groan, Oh my God, what can we do with her? We must get her out at once, over the wall, eh? And at once, quick! Johnstone, quick, go and find a rope, quick, a rope. And Faz said, it does begin to look a little foolish. Oh, I'm feeling so damn bad. But you can't blame a fool for anything it does, can you? But I am bad. I'm going to bed instantly. I feel quite out of my depth here. Oh, that young friend of yours, that Simpkins. Charming young person. Very blithe he was, dear Evans Antrobus.
Everybody now seemed to rush away from the room except the girl Lulu and Evans Antipas. He was evidently very agitated and in a bad humor. He clumped about the room, exclaiming, Oh, damnation, do hurry up, somebody. What am I going to do with her, you boozy little pig? Do hurry up. Who's a pig? I want to go out of here, shrilled Lulu, and apparently she made for the door. You can't go like that, he cried. You can't, you mustn't. Don't be a fool, Lulu. Lulu, now, isn't it a fearful mess? I'm not going to stop here with you, ugly thing. I don't like it. I'm going now. Let go. But you can't go, I tell you, in these things, not like that. Let me think, let me think, can't you? Why don't you let me think, you little fool? Put something on you, my overcoat, cover yourself up. I shall be ruined, damn you. Why the devil did you come here, you? And who brought me here, Mr. Antipas? Oh, yes, I know you. I shall have something to say to the vicar, or whoever it is you're afraid of, baby face. Let me go, I don't want to be left here alone with you, she yelled. Simpkins heard an awful scuffle. He could wait no longer. He flung open the door, rushed into the room, and caught up a siphon, the first handy weapon. They saw him at once, and stood apart, amazed. "'Fine game!' said the trembling Simpkins to the man, with all the sternness at his command. As nobody spoke, he repeated, quite contemptuously, "'Fine game!' Lulu was breathing hard, with her hands resting upon her bosom. Her appearance was so startling to the boy that he nearly dropped the siphon. He continued to face her, hugging it with both hands against his body. She was clad in pink tights. They were of silk. They glistened in the sharper light from under the violet shade. A soft white tarlatan skirt that spread around her like a carnation and a rose-colored bodice. She was dainty, with a little round head and a little round face like a briar rose. But he guessed she was strong, though her beauty had apparently all the fragility of a flower. Her hair, of dull dark gold, hung in loose tidiness without pin or braid, the locks cut short to her neck where they curved in to brush the white skin. A deep, straight fringe of it was combed upon the childish brow. Gray were her surprised eyes, and wide pouting, and wide the pouting lips. Her lovely naked arms, oh, he could scarcely bear to look at them. She stood now, with one hand upon her hip, and the other lying against her cheek, staring at Simpkins. Then she danced delightfully up to him, and took the siphon away. Look here, said Evans Antibus to Lulu. He had recovered his nerve and did not express any astonishment at Simpkins' sudden appearance. He is just your size. You dress up in his clothes, quick. Then it's simple. No, said the girl. And no for me, said Simpkins, fiercely, almost. Just then the door was thrust partly open and a rope was flung into the room. The bringer of it darted away downstairs again. Hi, here, called Evans Antipas, rushing to the door. But nobody stayed for him. Nobody answered him. He came back and picked up the rope. Put on that coat, he commanded Lulu, and that hat. Now, look here, not a word, not a giggle, even, or we're done, and I might just as well screw your blessed neck. Would you? snorted Simpkins, with not a little animosity. Yes, would you? chimed Lulu, but nevertheless she obeyed and followed him down the stairs. Then she turned and beckoned. Simpkins followed, too. They crossed a dark quadrangle and passed down a passage that was utter darkness through another quad, another passage, and halted in a gloomy yard behind the chapel, where Evans Antipas struck a match, and where empty boxes, bottles, and other rubbish had accumulated under a wall about ten feet high. "'You first, and quiet, quiet,' growled Evans Antipas to Simpkins. No one spoke again. Night was thickly dark, the stars were dim, the air moist and chill. Simpkins, assisted by the other man, clambered over rickety boxes and straddled the high, thick wall. The rope was hung over, too, and when the big man had jumped to earth again, dragging his weight against it, Simpkins slid down on the other side. He was now in a narrow street, with a dim lamp at one end that cast no gleam to the spot where he had descended. There were dark, high-browed buildings looming high around him. He stood holding the end of the rope and looking up at the stars. Very faint, they were. The wall was much higher on this side, looks like a mountain, and he thought of Ben Nevis again. This is out of your depth, if you like, out of your depth entirely. It was all wrong, somehow, or at any rate, it was not all right. It couldn't be right. Never again would he mess about with a lot of lunatics. He hadn't done any good. He hadn't even got the money. He had forgotten it. He had not got anything at all except a headache. The rope tightened. Lulu was astride the wall, quarreling with the man on the other side. Keep your rotten coat. She slipped it off and flung it down the wall. And your rotten hat, too, spider face. He flung that down from the wall and spat into the darkness. Turning to the other side, she whispered, 
I'm coming, and scrambled down, sliding into Simpkin's arms. And somehow he stood holding her so, embracing her quite tightly. She was all softness and perfume. He could not let her go. She had scarcely anything on. He would not let her go. It was marvelous and beautiful to him. The glimmer of her white face was mysterious and tender in the darkness. She put her arms around his neck. Oh, I rather love you, she said. End of section four, Ballet Girl.